This episode of Plastic Weekly is brought to you by Braden Laverty and the rest of my Patreon supporters who help make this show happen by donating a dollar or two each week. I know I've been AWOL for a few weeks, but I am grateful for everyone who listens and donates. I've just had serious motivational issues as far back as I can remember, especially when it comes to certain things. But Nationals is now over, and I'm glad to put out some more material for people like you, Braden. And thanks for saying hi back at Boulders that time. That was cool. This week's episode is a talk from Jeff Thompson, who has a long history in sports administration and has joined Climbing Escalade Canada as their first ever high performance director. He's been stopping at Canada's different national events and giving talks to help explain his role and his plans, so I decided to record his most recent talk at Open Bouldering Nationals and share it with you guys. The setup wasn't perfect, so the audio isn't what I hoped for, but I edited it down to make it fairly streamlined and direct. He brings a lot of interesting perspective, so even if you aren't a Canadian or a competitive climber, I think it's a worthwhile listen to hear how Olympic aspirations will affect the direction of competitive climbing. I hope you enjoy it. So, first of all, I just want to thank everyone uh, for coming. We really appreciate you, the CC, really appreciate you you coming in, and I really appreciate you spending your time uh, to listen. So, as you know, I, I, I only started this now two and a half months ago or so, and it's been amazing. And I'll probably say this a few times, but I'll say it now while I think of it. It's just been such a pleasure to work in this community. My main involvement, as you can see from that, has been high performance artistic gymnastics. And uh, I always try to clear my name of the mud that's going on in that sport right now. It's, it's got some really serious issues that are being dealt with, which is, which is great. But uh, as I told Steve when I applied for the position, one of the, the main driving forces for me in being involved was to see this new sport, this new Olympic sport, and as, as much as I could possibly at least, help it not become like artistic gymnastics, where the kids aren't treated with respect and, and there's abuse going on physically, psychologically, and emotionally. So for me, this was absolutely a big motivating thing. And, and I love climbing too. So why did they hire me maybe part of this? Is to let you know, but so my background has been in high performance sport now for, for close to 40 years. And uh, I was the director of our national team program for artistic gymnastics, so that meant preparing them for the Olympic Games and doing all the high performance management of that. I was also a lecturer at the University of British Columbia for almost 20 years in gymnastics, high performance coaching, and and qualitative biomechanics. Um, Then attended four Olympics for Canada in a number of capacities, normally as an official or a judge. That's the main thing I do. And, And yes, I do climb, so for 27 years, which is older than most of the competitors, I think. Uh, I was involved on executive level with Sport Climbing BC, very involved with Climbers Access Society of BC, which did some amazing work in terms of protecting outdoor resources. And I was, I was telling Steve, I'm, I'm so happy because two of my roots made it into GRIP this month, so you know. So, and I've been involved in coaching. I've been really lucky that in the beginning of the EDGE program, I was asked by, at uh, that time, a guy named Sean Fader and then Andrew Wilson to help with some of the development of their programs because they were starting to recognize that there's methodologies and concepts in gymnastics that can and, and will apply to, uh, to climbing. So in terms of a basic system or philosophy of, of how sport in Canada is, is essentially governed or the philosophical basis from which decisions are made is, it's something called athlete-centered. And that's all decisions and actions must reflect an optimization of the performance of the athlete. Everything that we do comes to that. And that happens through the coach. The coach is for sure the, the, the pillar, the stable part of a good sports system, which is really why I'm hired is to help you create a system to produce consistent results over time. Coaches are the ones responsible for their performance and they have to have the authority when it comes to making decisions. Udo and I were speaking about this because sometimes when this philosophy came out, there was a misunderstanding about this athlete centered, meaning the athlete tells you what to do. It doesn't work that way. Athletes can't make the best decisions often it, that are best for them. It's very exceptional because they have all sorts of different reasons for doing that psychological and otherwise, right? So the coach has to drive. Of course, they consult a lot, a lot, a lot. And climbing is beautiful in that way because I think the dialogue is quite good. But essentially, the coach is the one that has to do what needs to be done for that athlete, keeping in mind the optimization of their performance. And then the last component is the administratively supported. And so that's the CC, that's everybody else that's involved that's not actually in the gym coaching the athlete to help them optimize that performance. 
And it seems like a really simple, common thing to say, but the reality is a lot of administrators in a lot of sports think that it's because of their existence that sport happens, but it's not. People will always climb, people will always do cartwheels, people will always do whatever they're doing, and then administrators come in. And there's a very wonderful quote by the head of the International Judo Federation that said, there's, there's certain people that live for sport and others who live off of sport. We want to be those people that live for sport and for the, for the athlete and for the, its, its beauty. So athletes, this is the kind of thing that you should expect to see around you. It's about creating a system where you're the middle and all decisions and all actions are focused towards you. So you have your coaches, you have your provincial sport organizations, your national sport organizations. I know I went through the uh, acronyms fast, but this is your sports science or medicine, or what's called IST, so integrated support team that's around you. Your national Olympic committees and other organizations, so for example, Pan American uh, and Commonwealth, these are different national, international organizations. Then you have your gym, your school, some people who are involved in schools, parents are critical, and the officials and judges. This is the group that's around you, and each person contributing in their way towards you optimizing your performance. In Canada, many of you have already seen this before and should be familiar with this. So this is the long-term athlete development program that sets the, the framework that we work out of in Canada. And if you haven't met her yet, Sylvia, do you mind? I'm going to point you out to stand up. Her and her group did an amazing job creating the LTAD for, for competition climbing in Canada. I was involved in doing the gymnastics one, and, and it's a, I think it's a good document, but I thought what they did was really amazing, because you can open that. And I don't know if I ever told you, but I was getting emails from, from kids in gyms who don't have coaches or anything telling me, this is so good, I, I've been reading it, and can you tell me and can you advise me? There's information in there for them that's really amazing. You have to have this or you cannot be recognized within the Canadian sports system by Sport Canada and the government. And all decisions relate to where you are on this athlete development pathway, okay? We're so beautiful and so lucky in climbing, I think, because you have the little kids that come into the gym and, and do the birthday parties and whatnot, but it's more than any sport I can actually think of, it's an active for life sport. Fred Becky is one of the great examples, you know? 90 something years old and I saw him in Squamish climbing five sevens well into his 90s, you know? It's just, absolutely fantastic uh, sport in that regard. And I think it's one of our big ways forward. It's a promotion of climbing as a lifetime activity. So athletes, this is the question you, you have to ask yourself. And I had a meeting with some of the athletes I worked with last night. You improve, but you don't progress. You improve, but you don't progress. In other words, you're climbing better. You're climbing maybe harder, but your ranking or your result is the same. This is the question we asked ourselves in gymnastics in Canada around 1999 and 2000. We had always been wallowing around 14th to 16th place in the country, always. And at that time, you had to be top 12 in the world to qualify a team to the Olympic Games. And we'd always been there. And then we had to ask ourselves this question, how radical a change were we prepared to make? What efforts are you prepared to take to break that cycle? I mean, we've been exceptionally lucky with, with, with Sean. It's phenomenal that what he's done uh, to achieve what he has. And our job is to create a consistent stream of Sean's over time. And that involves, in some cases, really sitting down and thinking, what do we need to do? And my job, and I'm working with, with other experts, because I'm not anywhere near the expert in climbing, but to take and synthesize information from others to say, what do we have to do? And hard decisions will have to be made because my job is high performance director, not participation director, okay? And we deal with this problem a little bit now. I think I showed this, this slide before, hey Fred? You know, it's, it's, um, it's a very interesting time we live in with, with young people. I started teaching in the university in the, in the 1980s and and, and the mentality of people straight out of high school to now is, is so completely different. And all of my colleagues say the same thing. It's kind of like, tell me what's on the exam because that's what I want to know, so blah, blah, blah. They just, this, there's something going on in the, in the millennials. And I don't mean that in a critical way because I've learned so much from the millennials in terms of how to view the world today differently. And I think in a very progressive, very good, very positive way. But there's some interesting stuff going on here. And I was mentioning that in the NHL and the Vancouver Canucks in particular, are really looking at changing the coaching strategies of the new athletes coming into the NHL. They want to know why. 
why are you asking me to do that? You know, so you can't just say, go hangboard you know, three times a week for a half an hour anymore. Why? Why am I doing this drill? What's about this? What's this? What's this? Why is that? And you have to know your shit or else. You know, they'll call you on it. And I, I really come to appreciate that. My students now, they, they call my, my BS all the time. And I always loved it. I love this guy's cartoon. This is, this is one of the other problems we're struggling with in society, you know. The instant gratification model. Everybody, everybody's participating. Everybody gets a t-shirt. And uh, I, don't, I, I like that stuff too, but that's, again, it's not my job. My job is to help produce high performance. My job is to, ha is to help get more winners, but there will always be losers. It's normal, right? So my job, and this is just a cut and paste directly from uh, the job application, I'm responsible for the development, planning, and execution of all the national team program and its initiatives, okay? And I just want to emphasize now and, and again and again that any of you at any time, at the end I'll give you my email and phone number. My job is to help you. You have to reach out, you have to contact me for anything at all. And, it, and when I'm starting to get emails now, it, it, it's really thrilling, you know. It's better than junk mail too, but you know. High performance committee role. This, this group is, is really critical because what they do is they're going to advise me, okay? They're going to advise the high performance director and the national coaches in the development planning of all those other things that we talked about. I think that when you have a really, really great high performance committee, then you have that high performance director that can make some hard calls, et cetera, because we are a very small community. Yes, there's going to be people that have uh, perceived conflicts of interest, this kind of thing. But I think what Steve's done in this structure is we've allowed a barrier for that to be less of a problem. They only can advise. They don't have final say. So in the past where it was coaches could make decisions, it's not going to exist anymore. They can only advise and it has to work its way up through the system this way. And I think that avoids the kind of problems that can happen when people have doubt. National coaches role, they're going to implement in conjunction with myself all of those programs and initiatives. Okay? And I want to point out, and I'll, I'll try not to write in pen on their, on their screen, ensuring consistent performance. This ensuring consistent performance. A term you will hear from time to time is this one. No accidental champions. It's a very powerful statement. No offense again, but Sean, in a way, was a really unique guy in the right place at the right time with all of those things to go there. That does not mean Canada has a system. And we'll never be able to be like former East Germany or whatever, but we have to do the best we can to create a system where we can produce more. And some countries are doing it. We know Austria and Slovenia and Germany have some stuff there, but it needs to be more. And uh, it's not meant in any way ever to be offensive, but it's, it, it can happen. There's, I was telling them earlier that in fencing, there was a club, a Hungarian guy moved to San Francisco, opened a gym. He had six guys on a team of eight fencers at the Olympic Games. They won four medals. Yeah. USA does not have a fencing program. He had a fencing program. You know, so it's, yeah, yeah. it's more than just that has to happen. So for the coaches that are here, you're the overall manager of the athlete's career. And I think that I like this idea of a manager, and it's a term that's used in European soccer or football. If you notice that, for Manchester United, they're not called the coach, they're called the manager, because there's much more to it, okay? Manager means you can go out and you can find resources to help support your athlete, okay? You're also a coach, but you have many other tasks that you do. But you make the day-to-day -day decisions regarding training, competitions, etc. in consultation. You seek out expertise, and you meet regularly with the parents. Keeping them in the loop is really important. And Many of you were there, so I'm sorry for some of you, some of this is repetitive, but the talk I gave at Youth Nationals was geared specifically towards the parents. And, and the one, pair, the one line I'll give you for that is I told them to basically stay out of, the, of coaching and just love their kids. Don't ever talk to them about their performance and this and that. Their job is to provide unconditional positive regard and love for their, for their kid. And there's, there's some very powerful documentaries. Unfortunately, I can't remember one, uh, but there's a, again an NHL player that went on to have tr tremendous problems with alcohol and drugs and stuff. And he said the worst time in his life ever was the ride home with his dad after the game when he was a young boy, where his dad would yell at him for an hour. You know, it's just horrible. So that's what I tried to drive in the parents. Just stay out of the, stay out of the way. So daily coach's role. This is going to become so, so important, everyone. Collaborate. You don't ever own an athlete. An athlete is this thing you should really feel very lucky to have that you're able to help develop as an athlete and a human being. And what we say is, I say, park your ego. 
you bring in other people, you bring in other coaches, you open your mind to listening to ideas, that athlete is more likely to progress. If your relationship is one where you're confident in what you're doing and you hear somebody say something to them you're not quite sure about, you can deal with that in a polite way later. You don't put them down. You say, oh, that's an interesting idea and we'll talk about that later. But you have to open yourself up for that because this is just life. And, and many people don't understand that actually when they study really highly successful athletes, they typically go through five coaching cycles. Someone who turns them on, loves the sport, someone who teaches them some, some basics, and then on and on to the, to the Bella Caroli, the person that was mentioned from Romania. He was a basketball coach. He didn't even really know gymnastics, but he was an incredible, incredible motivator for that last stage in LTAD where you're, where you're, where you're trying to win. And so in climbing, like gymnastics, that's a little bit hard because you, you just don't move through a system of clubs or schools or universities. But generally, think about it. It takes five people for, to produce a top-level athlete in general. And I love this phrase from one of... Uh, one of the great coach educators in the world, a guy named Dr. Keith Russell. We train tissues and we coach people. You, know, you don't train a climber, you're training a human, you, know, you, you adapt the muscle, you adapt uh, for power, endurance, strength, whatever it might be, but you're always working with people, coaching with people. And I know Tiff's got some, she's an amazing coach of people, you know? And you have to think about this. You prepare the tissue, but you work with a human being. You need to study and learn sports sciences. And we can't stress enough this part. How, and and I'll, the next talk I probably do for everybody will be at, uh, in Victoria, I think, at the, at the national championships there, on the special characteristics of dealing with someone during what's called their peak height velocity or their puberty, when they're growing super fast. It's the highest, uh, the, the, the worst moment for the possibility of injuries and how we have to adapt to that. And uh, the story I, I love to tell about that, I was in, in Moscow when it was the Soviet Union, uh, studying gymnastics and studying coaching. And in the, in the Central Army Club, they had uh, a bunch of kids in the corner of this gym with many, many Olympic champions in the gym. And they were goofing around, they were fighting and punching each other. And this was the Soviet Union, you know. And I thought, that's crazy, it must be the coaches' kids. It must be the coaches' kids having fun. So I asked, I asked the director general something or other about that. And he says, they're teenagers. You can't, you can't push teenagers so hard. They'll quit because they'll say, why am I doing this? That's even the Soviet Union. Remember, they could actually do whatever they wanted. But they, they even understood they couldn't beat a teenager. You, nobody can beat a teenager. It's like a toddler when they're screaming, you know? They get injured. They get demotivated. They get all this stuff. They back off tremendously to this period of peak height velocity. Because then at the end of that, they're still there. And all of the preparation you did can be built on. 80%, and I think it's even higher for young girls and women, quit sport at 14, right around peak height velocity. So we're losing 80% of our athletes. And a big part of it is because we don't understand it's important to back off. So your PSO, your provincial sport organization, whatever that governing body has, its roles to assist you. Training and competitions, facilitating access, providing information. WADA is the World Anti-Doping Agency. We, uh, you're going to have to become very, very aware, those of you competing and traveling internationally, because of the level of recognition we now have, a group called CCES, or Canadian Centre for Ethics and Sport, will come in and you'll have to pee in front of a person. It's not one of the great joys of being a high-level athlete, but you will. You'll have to go in and they'll have to watch you pee and they'll have to take this for a sample. Again, they facilitate access to sports science and medicine, information, act as liaisons between you and, for example, the IFSC or the International Olympic Committee or the Pan American Organization. They do that job for you. More and more stuff gets taken care of for you by this group. And really important as we go forward, we'll be creating this coach education program, a standardized coach education program. Absolutely critical. It's not only critical for our sports development, but it's critical for the development of the CEC. Without a recognized coach education program, you can only go so far in terms of support and funding from the federal government. They require coach education. And in large, it's become even more critical and urgent and, and because of the, the problems in sport that, that Udo and I were alluding, alluding to, the abuse, especially in gymnastics. Lots and lots of requirements for safe sport training uh, to protect children. So your IST, or sports science group, they work through the national coach and the daily coach in consultation with the parent. So obviously, especially with underage athletes, the parent has to be very, very involved in this. So we're talking about the underage athlete. Proactive medical, proactive medical. I probably should have 
should have you know, really highlighted that. Because the thing that happens all too often is, I'm injured, so now I'm going to go use my physiotherapy that I have on my parents' plan. You should be seeing a physiotherapist before you have a problem, to avoid the problem. A good physiotherapist can identify just by how you're moving if something's wrong with you. Of course, there's rehab that goes in there to all of the other sports science, and they will assist you with keeping up with the hold water thing, because as Udo mentioned, it's very, very strict. So National Olympic committees and other major games organizations, they facilitate and ensure often. It's, it's quite funny that the Canadian Olympic Committee actually has very, very little to do with any sort of sport development in Canada. They, they do supply some funding, but they, they have no really significant role whatsoever in Canada of driving the development of sport. They only really kick in when you're in the Olympics. That's when they step up, which is kind of, I don't know, it's, it's not a system I particularly think is good. I don't know, in Germany, uh, what? Same thing. Same thing, yeah. yeah. In Switzerland, which is phenomenally successful in so many sports, the Olympic Committee is the top, top part of sport, but they take care of high performance, they take care of participation, they take care of everything. I personally think it's a better model, you know? So the official's role. It's not so important. I, I, the slide is here in part because I also use it a little bit for gymnastics talks. But I think in gymnastics, if you don't have a good relationship with your judges and your officials, it's impossible to do well. I think that we can all learn, and there was some stuff that happened here. I heard we had an appeal about jumping up to, you know. We need to work with our officials and our judges so our athletes have an absolutely clear understanding of what they can and cannot do. The last thing I, I, I just hate to see is when an athlete is not able to get the result they deserve for a technicality. We should never, ever allow that to happen to any of our athletes ever. For them to say, oh, I didn't know, nobody told me. When we said we had a group of people surrounding an athlete trying to get them somewhere, that athlete shouldn't feel bad. Somebody in the officials, judges part, coaches part, should feel really guilty. They should be saying, oh shit, I forgot to tell them about that. You need to have this cooperation back and forth. It's so critical. So, high performance. This is a little bit more down into some specifics of the high performance and what we're going to be looking at doing. For sure, the most important thing is planning and planning every single component of your training. The attention to detail that Udo mentioned. Because if you, if you fail to plan, you're planning to fail. There's no doubt about it. You have to have that program in place. If you don't, how do you know what works, what doesn't work, what do you have to adjust, et cetera, et cetera. And we use this amazing quote from a guy named Vitaly Sherbo who in 1992 uh, appeared to come out of nowhere and win, as you can see, <laughs> his fair share of Olympic medals. And uh, I was at a conference where he was speaking and he said he talked about all of these years and years and years of tissue preparation, spatial orientation preparation, 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 preparation. Of course he's still doing, and, and we, I think we can see some comparisons in climbing. You're still climbing, but you're getting your body ready for the great forces that are going to happen later. And this is so critical. We know we have growth plate problems in the fingers and stuff. You better start preparing early for that before you do some sudden loading, right? Take your time, prepare those tissues, and the results will come. First thing athletes you have to think about is you have to sit down and you have to think about your goals. Without goals, you have nothing. And we often say great, big, hairy, audacious goals. Set a really, really big goal, a reasonable goal, but set the goal that's so high that it's your dream. And now for us, for many of us, it's the, it's the Olympics. And I want you to think about one thing that's really important for this goal setting part. It's that one of the one of the outcomes, if you will, of setting a goal like, I want to go to the Olympics is, you may or you may not make it, because that's been your goal. And you'll be right in that line. And every successful athlete I've met, and I've met literally probably hundreds of Olympic medalists, all set their goal to win the Olympics. And guess what? They all went to the Olympics easily. It was not even a question of them going, because their goal was there. If you set your goal there, you'll get, that's where you'll be. And if you say, you go, I want to make the Canadian team to go to the World Championships, I guarantee you, in general, you'll be a mediocre person. Because you're going to go there and you say, I made it, that's it. That's not enough anymore. It's not enough for me as high performance director, and I know it won't be enough for my high performance committee. But set those goals. And it's all the way down. You shouldn't come into the gym on a given day without an idea of something you want to do better. Every single day. Today, I'm going to do this. Today, I want to do that. And then, at the end, you have a reflection period. And I strongly encourage you athletes, if your coaches aren't already doing it, you get together at the beginning, 
And this is something I've seen Andrew doing really well with, with the, the kids at his gym now. The beginning of the training, they form a circle. They talk about anything that might be weighing on their mind. They clear it, you know, something, this happened, that happened, I have an exam, I'm not feeling good. Okay. And then what we now added to that is this goal. What's your goal for today? What are you going to work on? Okay, great. At the end of the day, you should come back together and say, how did that go? It creates this team atmosphere. It creates accountability. It creates a number of things that seem small, but for all of these, again, details make the difference. Get together and line up. And you watch in sports, uh, and I know it's a bad sport sometimes, but gymnastics, they all line up at the beginning. The coach talks. He lays out everything they're going to do that day. Everybody's on board, and then they go. And just kind of casually coming in and stroking around. It's, it's, it's not the best way. And something I think that's really important. When we set the high performance program, when that's done and it comes out and you say, oh, that's amazing. I really want to win the Olympics. That's my goal. But I can't do this. That's fine. Then you have to change your goal. Everything you do to compromise, saying, well, no, I, I really like it, but I can only train this many hours. I, oh, I can't do that. That's OK. That's fine but reset your goal. And your coach and everyone else will adjust accordingly to help you meet that new goal. Because if you can't do all of the things, and it's a, it's a pretty linear system, honestly, in sport. You want to do this, you have to train this many hours, blah, blah, blah. There's a pretty, pretty good idea of what you have to do. And if you can't, and that's fine. I think that's really important to understand that that's fine. But be honest with yourself and be honest with your, as a coach, be honest to say you can't do it. Example of what I'm talking about, this is just, what we use in gymnastics, for example. This is just for floor exercise and just for uh, a final outcome skill, which is down here. We want a gymnast to be able to do this. So if we, I want a gymnast to be able to do that, they have to do all of these things by those ages at that quality. And we've done that for every single skill, basically. And we've done that even in strength parameters and flexibility parameters, because we know that if by nine or 10 years of age, you're not able to do this trick at a 75% level, you can't, you'll fall behind here. And you go, oh my God, I don't know if climbing can be quite like that, but we have to start to think like this. We know there's going to be technical and physical and flexibility parameters that you have to develop by a certain time. Yeah. Okay, so the components of your program, and there's, there's actually much more detail than this, but I wanted to hit on a few, only a few today that I think are the main emphasis for now. The technical, and this is the training, the climbing, problems, routes, drills, etc. Also, strength and its related attributes. You build a foundation of strength, and if you look at Sean's plan, you'll see that there's a phase where he builds strength, and then he uses that strength and he recruits it into power, and then he might be doing his endurance training at a different time for, for lead, and, 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 and then the same thing for flexibility. When are you working your flexibility? You are, and we talked about this flexibility versus mobility. Your active versus your passive flexibility has to be all in there, and it's for every sport. Okay, and there's probably some more there that I'll expand as I learn and understand more about the technical demands of climbing. But tactical considerations, which is really competitions. What, when, and how? And, you know, oh, I, I, I hear it all the time. Well, I haven't decided yet if I'm going to this World Cup. I'm like, what do you mean you haven't decided yet? You should know three years before. I know sometimes the IFSC calendar is hard and all these problems. But if you're doing a good job, you plan as far out as absolutely possible because from that competition, you work backwards in your planning. So it has different phrases, but I, I just like the term backwards planning. So for Sean, he has the Olympics here. He will sit down with his sports science guy and he'll say, I need to do this, 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 and this here. He should have it all laid out leading up into there. Now there's nothing worse than a really rigid plan. If something goes sideways, you have to have flexibility and to be able to adjust it. But you need to plan back to know exactly what you're going to do at what phases towards that so you peak at the appropriate time. Of course, competition strategies as well. And for me, this whole psychological thing is, is, is really key. They say that at the elite level, 80% of performance is, is psychological. But do you spend 80% of your time training your mind? Most people spend like next to no time training their mind. Yet at the ultimate time where every, all the top climbers are so good, it so often comes down to how strong their mind is. So psychological training. I think at a very young age, uh, coaches, this is when you teach the basic skills. You get in a, any old good old reasonable sports psychologist person will teach them about relaxation, visualization, etc. These are just simple skills and tools they need to develop. A bigger issue, and it, it really plays a huge role, is the personal stuff and the, the self-confidence, the self-esteem, the issues you might have that prevent you from being the best athlete you can be. 
the number of the number of athletes who never achieve their best because they have insecurities that relate to something. Perhaps it's 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 their body image. Perhaps it's the way their parents treat them. Whatever. This also has to be addressed. Uh, our best guy, Kyle Schufeld, who was an Olympic gold medalist in 2004 for gymnastics from Canada, he had a lot of personal issues, and was once he settled that out, he he just rocketed. So he started to see a psychologist, counselor, helped him with that. He'd already gotten great skill stuff, and then he was able to move on. And this is, for me, one of the main things, and it's a, all of these things are processes, understand. Nothing is ever done. You're always working on these things. It's to focus only on what you can control. Nothing more important for you to do. For example, we have a problem. I hate that kind of problem. What can you do about it? Nothing. It's cold in the gym. What can you do? Nothing. It's hot in the gym. What can you do? Nothing. Oh, that judge, I remember that judge screwed me last time. He didn't give me the finish, you know? Nothing you can do about it. It's the hardest thing to do, but it's the easiest thing to do. Focus on what you can control at all times in your preparation, in your life, you know? As soon as I started doing this, I stopped having so much road rage. Yeah. yeah? That asshole cut me off, you know, but it's over, it's done, you know? What can you do? For me, I sort of skipped past this one, the mindfulness. Uh, so mindfulness, if you're not familiar with the term, is really essentially about becoming, learning to be in the moment, to be in the moment. And um, right now in the USA, which has a very successful sports program, we know in general, this has become the go-to, the number one psychological training tool for their elite athletes is mindfulness. Every one of us as climbers has experienced that feeling when you're, you're flowing along and everything's going great and then you realize that you're, you might be going to clip the anchor soon. And you go, oh, I think I might top this and you fall because you left the process. Staying in that process, staying in that process. Don't worry about the outcome. And mindfulness, for me, it's brilliant. And, and if, if any of you have ever had, I've only experienced a couple of times in my climbing where it was the whole thing, I don't even remember it until I was at the top. It was just such a beautiful sensation of flow. And health, it's all the time. You have to think and breathe that all the time. All of these athletes I've mentioned, just they're so rigid and controlled in their diet. So these are about the national team expectations. Take responsibility and be an athlete. This be an athlete is a phrase that Christian has taught me. Being an athlete means that all of this stuff we talk about with your, your journaling, your eating, your planning, your sleeping, your thinking, and all of that stuff and take a responsibility for it. Yes, there's people around you, but you, especially as, you know, as open, you're adults, you have to do what you need to do. Support everyone on the team. My goal, above all else, in some ways, is to create a harmonious team atmosphere. Without harmony within a team, and uh, the, our gymnastics team achieved its best results. Uh, we were fifth in the world as a team from being, like I mentioned, around 15, when we had this harmony within the team. We got rid of people that were negative, and some of those people were better than others on the team. We got rid of coaches that were negative, even though maybe they knew stuff, because when they came in, they did and acted in ways which took away from that harmony. No trash talking. It does, it's, you don't know someone else's story. You might say something that you think is funny, but it could really be hurtful. Okay? So think about that. It's become very common. In, oh, I know now, and I, my teen, wherever he's gone, he tells me, ah, I know everybody knows I'm joking, but you don't know for some people how it is affecting them, okay? Let's communicate a lot. We need to know what's going on. The last thing I ever want is to say, yeah, this was happening, or I needed this, I needed that. Let me know. And that's for things you need, that's for things we have done that piss you off, whatever. Don't worry. Just communicate. The more we communicate, the better the system will be, for sure. And this is the journal kind of part that, uh, that Udo alluded to, complete training reports. Now, Andrew's already got a very good app. I know some Climbase 5 athletes are using it where they have to fill it out and send it in. National team athletes will be getting involved with that. And I can tell you now that with many of these expectations, it doesn't matter who you are, how good you are, if you're not complying with parts like we have an athlete agreement I'll refer to later, then you're out. So this journaling, we, we know it's so important, this reflection is so important that when Andrew gets rolling on this, you'll have to do this as a national team athlete, and if you don't do it, you'll have some warnings, etc. but eventually we'll find someone more serious to replace you. Okay? Because we have to start to generate this kind of discipline. We understand people have problems and lives, so communicate. I can't do it right now, my, you know, my grandma died, whatever it is, I just tell us, you know, it's okay. 
don't try to BS us. Either do it or let us know why you can't and then we can move on. There's an athlete agreement. Sean's done a tremendous job on that. It's going to be super good. Dressing and behaving as professionals. I think the sport's growing and, and it, I even hate gymnastics people are terrible. You watch our Canadian hockey team, even the youngest teams, they dress when they travel somewhere. Like people know they're a Canadian athlete going somewhere. Right? And it, 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 it creates this atmosphere that I think is quite important. I know in climbing this might take some time because we're all a little bit rebels in our own ways, but eventually over time, this will be something that's important. Coachability, it's this, it's this term that I think is really important. And, and what does that mean? I think it relates to this. Do coaches have favorites? Yes. And that's why. That person that listens, that responds, that works with them cooperatively and is not always being like an obstacle, you know? do this. Of course question your coach and work with your coach, but ultimately there's some people that are really hard to get to and your coach eventually will just turn and be with that person that's listening and responsive and wants to work and wants to do what's that sort of stuff. It's a, it's a human nature, even though this person might be super talented, and often they are, they're very temperamental, some of the most uh, spectacular athletes, but it's really hard for the coach to say, I just don't want to go over there and be abused anymore by that person who just tells me that I'm not doing that, you know? And I, I've talked to Christian about this. He's got some athletes he just refuses to work with because he says, I'd like you to do this. They say, no, I'm going to do this. He's like, okay, see you later. That's it, finished. Coachability, making yourself open to what's going on. Time management is absolutely critical in a successful athlete's life. I'd argue that it's like three to four hours away. Most students, Kevin found, couldn't account at this time. This was pre-social media, actually. I should mention pre-social media. Couldn't account for six to eight hours a day of their life. I don't know what I... I, I don't know, I guess I watch TV, I'm not sure. I was with my friend, but I'm not sure. There's six to eight hours a day they couldn't account for. So today, with different things we know, they have lots of time to enjoy their life, they have lots of time to socialize, they have lots of time to do whatever they do, and th we just have this based on a 24-hour training uh, model, okay? So you can go to school and do that. Many, many, in fact, uh, most of the high-performance athletes in the United States maintain well above average GPAs. The grade point averages are well above average of non-student athletes. Again, it's a time management thing. It's one of the things as parents we can sell. You know, your kid learns to manage their time and they can, they can, do, they can do it all, but it's, not, it's about not wasting time. And this again is, are you serious? If your goal is the Olympics, this is something you have to sit down and do. And this is everyone's responsibility. And it was, it was taught to me by a woman named Debbie Muir, uh, who produced Olympic medalists uh, in Calgary to never say anything that doesn't contribute to enhancing performance. And this relates a little bit to what we were saying earlier. And this is for parents, it's for coaches, it's for everybody. Why do we ever talk about something that could distract the athlete from their job? The roots, for example, or the judge that I mentioned earlier, or something else. We, as, anytime you talk to an athlete, you have to reflect on and think, is this going to play with their mind in a good way or a bad way? All the time think about that. And it's the same thing like for the parents I tried to stress with them. When you're driving home, don't say to them, you know, I, I think that, that judge maybe you know, should have given me that. It's not your job to say, yeah, you're right, you were screwed. How does that help that kid? You can say, I can understand how you feel that way, but you know, don't worry about it, it's over, we have to move on. You can really do a lot of damage if you're not careful about this. And athletes will sometimes grasp onto stuff that's ne said negatively because maybe they're anxious and they're nervous. And then I, was, I want to say this, that behind every fearless player is a fearless coach who refuses them to let them be anything but the best. As coaches, and we talked about this a lot yesterday, the coach sometimes really has to get that athlete and push them into a spot where they, they may not be comfortable because they're dealing with anxieties and stress and all kinds of stuff. And it's that balance between being you know, encouraging and, and, and somewhat pushing of them and being unethical about it because it's really a struggle. Those of you that are athletes know that there's days where your insecurities are wreaking havoc with you and your coach is there to say, I know you're having a tough time, but we got to do this and you keep pushing them along. It, they're such a critical component of, of you as an athlete making it to where you want to be. Their job is to do that. They're not going to, and this is I think what Udo and I are talking a bit about here, they're not going to hold your hand and tell you everything's going to be okay. You're going to meet really shitty people. You're going to have really bad things happen to you. All of that stuff's going to happen. We're not trying to candy coat life at all, but let's go, you know, in this direction. So for the future, some of the things that we're doing, it's very premature for me to have come in and start to lay down 
structural changes, rule changes, policy changes. So the first thing that's going to happen is a complete review of the existing rules regulation, especially as they relate to things like selection policies. So that's, this is stuff I'll be doing in conjunction with the High Performance Committee. For example, I know I already want to, ha I want to really think strongly about what we're going to do for selecting to World Cups. And it is going to change and it is going to get harder. But I didn't feel that was the right time two months in to impose that now. So we didn't do it. Believe me, there was pressure already from, from, from people to say, no, we need higher standards already now. And I said, no, let's take our time, let's talk to people, let's find out what we have and then find a way forward that is not going to discourage too many people. But there are going to be increased standards. It's not going to be like it was. So I'm warning you now. This thing where, okay, if nobody gets to go, but you were in the top 20, you get to go to a World Cup, will not exist next year. Right? The World Cup is a World Cup. It's the best in the world. And we don't send people there anymore to come. They're 20th in Canada. They're going to come 80th there. And that actually means they're 1,000th in the world because a whole bunch of Slovenians didn't come and Austrians didn't come and Germans didn't come and everybody didn't come. So the standard, we have to raise our game, for sure. And those standards will be a big part of that. We absolutely want to start implementing training camps. We need to get together. We need that whole collaborative thing that we talked about, getting together and pushing each other. So many great athletes are by themselves in a gym working with their coach and still doing very well, but imagine how much better they can be when they're together with others. The national coach will look at ongoing monitoring and visitations. I think there's something called the daily training environment. This is very important, the daily training environment. We can give you a program, but if your facility doesn't have the, the kind of walls or the additional training materials that you need, we need to know that. So the visitations are very important to see where our top climbers are training and what that looks like. And other stuff is coming down the pipe. I think the CEC will be announcing soon. There is money coming forward, which is going to be amazing, and we can support you more. With that support will come responsibilities for you. Up to now, maybe it's been hard to say, you must do this, 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 and this, because I pay everything. But when we're able to help you out, then it becomes a, a different game. Having said that, it shouldn't really matter, though. You're representing Canada, whether you pay or not. And you have to behave and prepare and, and act in a certain way, OK? And then just bear in mind this little phrase, which I have no idea who I stole it from. But good is the enemy of great. Good isn't good enough. We want to be great. We want to have a lot of very, very amazing athletes, right? And we're too often satisfied with being good. And that's the culture we have to change, right? And we, can, we, we can't change people's personalities or minds to be that, but we can help to create a system that, that pushes it this way. Yeah? How's that for a sudden ending? Because of the relaxed nature of the talk, there wasn't a great time to end it, so that's it for this episode of Plastic Weekly. Thanks to Jeff Thompson for letting me record his remarks, and thanks to you guys for listening. Plastic Weekly is presented and produced by me, Tyler Norton. If you like this episode, consider donating a dollar or two each week to my Patreon at patreon.com slash plasticweekly, or just leave a rating or review in your podcast app. Or do me a huge solid and subscribe to the Plastic Weekly YouTube channel. I don't use it much, but occasionally I'll be posting interviews if the opportunity presents itself, so check it out. Make sure you visit plasticweekly.com to find footnotes, references, and other bonus content related to our episodes. And if you want to get in touch with me, you can leave a comment there, or you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can send me an email to tyler at plasticweekly.com with your comments, concerns, questions, compliments. Just tell me you're out there somewhere. Good luck to everyone competing this weekend. I'll be thinking about you. Talk to you next week. Yeah.